This is Eric from Stanford, and today I'm going to be discussing everything you will ever need to know about liver function tests, what they are, and an overview of how to interpret them. The specific learning objectives are first to list the tests commonly included under the heading of liver function tests, more commonly known as LFTs. Second, to explain the basic normal physiology of each of these molecules. Next, to list the common etiologies for specific LFT abnormalities. And the last, to recognize common patterns of multiple LFT abnormalities, which suggest specific diagnoses. So what exactly are LFTs? They are a commonly ordered panel of blood tests, which as you might guess, evaluate liver function. However, they evaluate much more than that. They also look at liver damage and at the integrity and function of the entire biliary system, including the intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts and gallbladder. And LFTs evaluate aspects of physiology outside of the hepatobiliary system altogether. For example, they provide some insight into coagulation, hemolysis, nutrition, and bone turnover, among many other conditions. The specific tests included under the general heading of LFTs are hepatic enzymes, tests of synthetic function, and bilirubin. In common practice, there are four hepatic enzymes of interest. Aspartate aminotransferase, abbreviated AST, alanine aminotransferase, or ALT, alkaline phosphatase, which is commonly informally abbreviated ALKFAS, and gamma-glutamyl transpeptidase, abbreviated GGT. AST and ALT are collectively known as the aminotransferases. In addition to these four enzymes, the literature also frequently discusses the diagnostic use of five nucleotidase. However, I've never seen it ordered once, so won't discuss it further here. Tests of synthetic function, that is how well the liver can synthesize new compounds, particularly proteins, include serum albumin and something called the International Normalized Ratio, or INR. And last, bilirubin is subdivided into unconjugated bilirubin, also known as indirect bilirubin, and conjugated or direct bilirubin. Although the indirect and direct terminology is still used in some textbooks and labs, it is based on an outdated lab assay technique and has nothing to do with physiology. I'll therefore refer to these as unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin for the remainder of the video. Now, when most people use the term LFTs in the clinic or on the wards, they're usually referring to a specific preset panel of blood tests, all drawn off of the same tube. The two tests not included in the standard LFT panel, at least not in the US, include the GGT and the INR. It makes sense not to include the INR since it needs to be drawn into a different type of specimen tube. However, it seems illogical to me that the GGT is not included. If labs are trying to save money by preventing redundancy, it would seem to be more logical to include the GGT and not ALKFAS and make ALKFAS the standalone test. Hopefully, by the end of the video, you'll understand why. In addition, there are several variations on how bilirubin is reported on an LFT panel. Uncommonly, although it would make the most sense, is it reported separately as unconjugated and conjugated. Instead, it is usually reported as conjugated and total bilirubin, or sometimes just total bilirubin. I'm going to now discuss these labs either one at a time or in pairs, including both the normal physiology of each and etiologies of potential derangements. First up are AST and ALT. AST and ALT are two examples of transaminases which catalyze a reaction between a keto acid and an amino acid in which the ketone and amine groups are exchanged. AST is found throughout the body, particularly in the liver, heart, muscle, kidney, and red blood cells, while ALT is found predominantly in just the liver. Therefore, increases in ALT are more specific than AST for pathology of the liver and biliary system. Looking at the specific list of etiologies of increases in AST and ALT can be seen in any form of hepatocellular disease, such as cirrhosis, hepatitis, drug toxicity, 
fatty liver, also known as steatohepatitis, and venous congestion from CHF, also known as congestive hepatopathy. It can also be seen in any form of biliary disease, such as cholidocolithiasis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, and cholangiocarcinoma, basically any disease that starts with the syllables coli. Often, diseases of the biliary system are collectively called cholestatic disease, a term which serves as a parallel to hepatocellular. In addition to hepatobiliary disease, which is the umbrella term for both hepatocellular and cholestatic disease, AST is also elevated in rhabdomyolysis, which is muscle breakdown, acute myocardial infarction, and hemolysis, though the elevation in the last entry is typically only modest. As previously stated, the etiologies of an increase in ALT are limited to hepatocellular and biliary disease only. Occasionally, you may hear people informally refer to an increase in AST and ALT in the absence of other overt signs of liver disease as a transaminitis, a term I personally don't like since its suffix implies the presence of inflammation, which may not actually be there. Let's take a look at how elevations in AST and ALT compare to one another in different disease states. ALT is usually greater than AST in most chronic liver disease that is not caused by alcohol, unless cirrhosis develops, at which point AST becomes typically greater than ALT. I don't know of a specific study in which relative increases in AST versus ALT are used to screen for when a patient with chronic hepatitis has developed cirrhosis, but to me it seems to be potentially something to look for. In the AST to ALT ratio above 2 in a patient with probable liver disease is strongly suggestive of alcohol as an etiology. The explanation as to why this happens is a little complex and beyond the scope of this video. An AST to ALT ratio above 5 is suggestive of an extrahepatic source of AST, such as rhabdomyolysis or an acute MI. Among patients with LFT increases due to liver disease, we can use the degree of elevation in formulating a differential diagnosis since certain diseases result in a stereotypical range of LFT elevation. The normal range of AST and ALT differs a little bit between different labs and depending on gender, but as a general rule, the AST and ALT should both be below 40 units per liter. Some sources advocate for a lower limit than this. In chronic hepatitis B or C infection, or with steatohepatitis, the transaminases can be near normal or even normal, and are usually not above about 200 to 300 units per liter. In alcoholic hepatitis, the AST typically ranges from about 100 to 500, with ALT about one half of that. In the HELP syndrome, which is a life-threatening complication of pregnancy, the transaminases are usually above 70 and can range into the high hundreds. Increases from drug toxicity, depending upon the exact situation, can be anything from barely noticeable to an AST and ALT in the thousands. And then acute viral hepatitis, ischemic hepatitis, known colloquially as shock liver, and acetaminophen overdose, all can result in transaminases ranging from the mid-hundreds to the many thousands. Let me move on to discuss ALKFAS and GGT. Although the latter is not included in the standard LFT panel, ALKFAS and GGT act like a pair in an analogous way to AST and ALT. Alkaline phosphatase is actually a collection of isoenzymes present throughout the body. The most clinically relevant forms of ALKFAS are found in the liver, bone, white blood cells, small bowel, and placenta, but its exact physiologic purposes in these sites are not known. Normal ALKFAS levels vary greatly depending on age and gender, and even depend upon blood type. And unfortunately, although ALKFAS exists as different isoenzymes, with different forms coming from different organs, there is no reliable means of testing for individual isoenzymatic forms. Because of this problem, we need the GGT. Gamma glutamyl transpeptidase catalyzes the transfer of a gamma glutamyl group from the glutathione to an amino acid, peptide, or water as part of the rarely discussed gamma glutamyl cycle. GGT is also increased in a broad range of hepatobiliary diseases, 
with similar sensitivity and specificity as ALKFAS. However, GGT is not present in bone in significant amounts. So let's compare the etiologies of increased alkaline phosphatase and GGT. The most important general etiology of a high ALKFAS is any form of biliary pathology. Next, any form of hepatocellular disease, though elevations from hepatocellular disease on the whole are less dramatic than those from biliary disease. Then any cause of high bone turnover or bone loss, such as bone metastases, Patchett's disease of bone, hyperthyroidism, or hyperparathyroidism. And the last major cause of a high ALKFAS is normal pregnancy, where elevations tend to be more modest than in the above three categories. Let's compare that to causes of an elevated GGT. So we have any form of biliary disease or hepatocellular disease, but instead of bone problems, there is alcohol abuse. Also, although I have never seen a situation in which this becomes relevant, diabetes, phenytoin use, and renal failure are all also reported to be associated with mildly elevated GGT levels. Here's a chart incorporating all the diagnostically relevant info about ALKFAS and GGT. In situations in which the ALKFAS is mildly or moderately elevated and the GGT is elevated, consider either hepatic or biliary disease. If the ALKFAS is severely elevated and the GGT is elevated, consider biliary disease only. If only the ALKFAS is elevated, the problem is likely in the bones. Finally, if only GGT is elevated, consider the possibility of alcohol abuse. While there really isn't a such thing as a pathologically low AST, ALT, or GGT, there are a small handful of random conditions that are associated with a low alkaline phosphatase level. For example, hypothyroidism, pernicious anemia, and zinc deficiency. And one really interesting association is an extremely low ALKFAS level seen in Wilson's disease, which appears to be best described in patients presenting with a combination of fulminant hepatic failure and hemolytic anemia. I've personally encountered such a, a case once in residency in which the patient, a 20-year-old woman, had an undetectable ALKFAS level. Had I not discounted it as some quirky lab artifact, it would have suggested the diagnosis much more quickly than the standard workup did, which took about two days. I'll now move on to tests of synthetic function. Albumin is a globular protein produced solely by the liver and comprises about half of the total protein in the blood. Albumin is negatively charged at physiologic pH and therefore it binds to cations such as calcium, sodium, and potassium, along with some hormones, conjugated bilirubin, and some medications. The primary function of albumin to maintain capillary oncotic pressure. Here is the startling equation, which mathematically describes the balance between fluid moving between the capillary or intravascular space with the interstitial space. Don't worry, I'm not going to discuss the details of this equation, but I just wanted to point out that albumin affects this value here, the capillary oncotic pressure. The greater the difference between the capillary and interstitial oncotic pressures, the more fluid will stay in the intravascular space and not leak out of the capillaries. There are three major categories of the etiologies of a low albumin. There can be decreased synthesis, as in chronic liver disease and malnutrition, increased loss, as in the nephrotic syndrome and the relatively uncommon condition of protein-losing enteropathy, and internal redistribution, as in increased capillary permeability, which might occur in the setting of severe sepsis. The consequence of a low albumin is related to fluid leaking into the interstitial space. So in the legs, we would see pitting edema, in which firm pressure applied to the subcutaneous tissue leaves an impression. And in the abdomen, it can contribute to the development of ascites, which is fluid accumulation in the peritoneal cavity. The next test of synthetic function is the INR. The INR is actually based on something called the prothrombin time, abbreviated PT, which is a measure of the extrinsic pathway of clotting, which is dependent upon clotting factors produced by the liver. If you're not familiar with the clotting cascade, don't worry, 
just remember that the higher the PT and the higher the INR, the less your blood is able to clot in response to trauma. The PT is a functional test that varies significantly between different labs. Therefore, a calculation called the International Normalized Ratio, or INR, was created which normalizes the PT so that values between different labs can be compared. Etiologies of an elevated INR are primarily related to a decreased synthesis of clotting factors. This can be due to chronic liver disease, as the liver is responsible for producing these. It can also be due to vitamin K deficiency, since their synthesis is vitamin K dependent. Causes of vitamin K deficiency include general malnutrition, fat malabsorption, and prolonged use of broad-spectrum antibiotics, as these can kill normal gut flora responsible for producing vitamin K. In addition, anticoagulants, specifically Coumadin and Argatroban, can affect the INR. And finally, in addition to decreased synthesis of clotting factors, an increased consumption of clotting factors, as seen in DIC, can also lead to a high INR. As expected, the primary consequence of a high INR is a generalized increased risk of bleeding, which can occur in the GI or GU tracts, or in the soft tissue, including retroperitoneal space. Here's a picture of a patient with a massive flank ecchymosis from a spontaneous retroperitoneal hemorrhage. The final test to discuss is bilirubin. Bilirubin comes from hemoglobin. As red blood cells break down, either through physiologic degeneration at the end of their normal lifespan, or as a consequence of pathologic hemolysis, hemoglobin releases heme, which is converted inside macrophages into a compound called biliverdin, which is then converted to unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated bilirubin travels to the liver, where it combines with glucuronic acid to form conjugated bilirubin. This step is important because unconjugated bilirubin is water insoluble, which impairs its ability to be excreted in bile, while conjugated bilirubin is water soluble. In addition, as mentioned briefly earlier, a fraction of conjugated bilirubin binds to circulating albumin, a form of bilirubin called delta bilirubin. This is clinically relevant because it helps to explain why resolution of an elevated bilirubin level can lag behind resolution of other lab abnormalities following correction of some form of hepatobiliary disease. The delta bilirubin may persist for as long as the albumin is in circulation, which has a half-life of several weeks. The etiologies of an elevated bilirubin depend greatly on which type of bilirubin is elevated. If both unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin is elevated, it is consistent with any diffuse hepatocellular or biliary process. An isolated increase of unconjugated bilirubin suggests either hemolysis or one of two genetic diseases, Gilbert's and kreigler najjar syndromes, in which there are problems with the conjugation step in bilirubin metabolism. I've put syndrome in quotation marks here because although they are referred to as, as syndromes in the medical literature, the actual genetics and biochemistry of these disorders are well established and their manifestations are so focused, it doesn't make sense to me to refer to them as syndromes at all. An isolated increase of conjugated bilirubin can be seen in early or mild biliary disease, as well as in two other genetic conditions, the Dubin-Johnson and Roter syndromes, the latter of which can also be associated with a concurrent increase in unconjugated bilirubin, but to a lesser extent than conjugated. The four genetic causes of hyperbilirubinemia can be difficult to remember, and I don't necessarily recommend working to commit them to memory, with the one exception of Gilbert's. Gilbert's syndrome is especially common, with as much as 5% of the population occasionally exhibiting subtle manifestations, which in the vast majority of patients includes only mild asymptomatic hyperbilirubinemia during periods of fasting or physiologic stress. What are the consequences of a high bilirubin? It's really only dangerous during infancy, during which it can lead to a spectrum of disease called bilirubin-induced neurologic dysfunction. This occurs in neonates who have bilirubin levels greater than 20 mg per deciliter. The bilirubin is directly toxic to the neurons of the sage, particularly in the basal ganglia and brainstem nuclei. The manifestations range from sleepiness and subtle hypotonia to seizures and death. Among infants who survive, the syndrome of permanent sequela is called kernicterus.
In older children and adults, a high bilirubin isn't directly dangerous at all, but can lead to a yellowish discoloration of the skin called jaundice and yellowish discoloration of the sclera called icterus. Both jaundice and icterus occur at a total bilirubin level above 2.5 to 3 mg per deciliter. So that was a relatively thorough review of the individual components of the category of liver function tests. In the last several minutes, I'm going to discuss the higher level patterns which emerge when looking at the LFTs as a whole. I consider there to be five basic patterns of LFT abnormalities based on the relative derangements of the various components. First is the hepatocellular pattern. In this, the AST and ALT are mildly to severely elevated. ALKFAS and GGT, as well as bilirubin, are normal to moderately elevated. Albumin is normal to moderately decreased. And the INR is normal to moderately increased. Next is the cholestatic pattern, in which the aminotransferases are normal to moderately increased. ALKFAS, GGT, and bilirubin are mildly to extremely elevated. And the albumin and INR are usually normal unless the cholestatic process is chronic and severe. In isolated hyperbilirubinemia, as the name implies, the only abnormality is the bilirubin. And in isolated synthetic dysfunction, the only abnormalities are albumin and INR. Finally, in the cirrhotic pattern, the aminotransferases are often normal, but can be mildly elevated. ALKFAS and GGT are typically normal and bilirubin, albumin, and the INR are all quite deranged. Put in a slightly more succinct way, the defining and most severe abnormality in a paleocellular disease is with the aminotransferases. In cholestatic disease, it's with the ALKFAS, GGT, and bilirubin. These two are obvious. And in cirrhosis, it's that combination of bilirubin, albumin, and the INR. If you're going to commit just one thing from this video to memory, it should probably be this chart. Now, some literature references also discuss a category for infiltrative diseases, which the primary derangement is an elevation of ALKFAS with a relatively normal bilirubin. I have not personally found this category to be frequent enough to consider on a regular basis. And the very last thing I'll discuss is a review of the etiologies of these various patterns and what the next steps typically are in the workup. With hepatocellular disease, if the AST to ALT ratio is greater than 2, consider alcoholic liver disease. If it's greater than 5, consider rhabdo. If the AST and ALT are above 1,000 units per liter, consider acute viral hepatitis, drugs and toxins, and ischemia. Otherwise, consider chronic viral hepatitis, steatohepatitis, milder forms of drug toxicity, and infiltrative diseases. The next steps for a patient with hepatocellular LFT pattern, review medication and alcohol history, check viral hepatitis serologies, and consider workup for other causes as appropriate. For example, workup for less common causes of chronic liver disease, such as hemochromatosis, autoimmune hepatitis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and Wilson's disease. For the cholestatic pattern, if ALKFAS and GGT are both increased, consider primary biliary diagnoses such as cholidocholithiasis, cholangitis, an obstructing pancreatic mass, primary biliary sclerosis, and cholangiocarcinoma, among many other diagnoses. If the ALKFAS is increased but GGT normal, consider bone disease as a likely cause. The next steps here, if GGT is elevated, get a right upper quadrant ultrasound, or debatably an abdominal CT. If the GGT is normal, consider a bone scan and or malignancy workup. In isolated hyperbilirubinemia, if the increased bilirubin is predominantly unconjugated, consider hemolysis or Gobera syndrome. Assuming the patient is not a neonate, in which specialized testing for Kreigler and Najjar may be warranted, the next step should be hemolysis labs. If the increased bilirubin is predominantly conjugated, possibilities include early biliary disease or relatively obscure genetic defects, and the next step should be a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Isolated synthetic dysfunction is usually due to malnutrition, 
nephrotic syndrome, or protein-losing enteropathy. For this, review diet history and check a UA for proteinuria. Finally, the cirrhotic LFT pattern is the end result of any chronic, untreated, or untreatable hepatocellular or cholestatic disease. For this, the next step would be a medication and alcohol history review, viral hepatitis serologies, and an abdominal CT, looking for both the cause of cirrhosis and to begin screening the patient for hepatocellular carcinoma. Additional workup beyond that should be considered if the first round of tests are unrevealing. So that concludes the very thorough review of liver function tests. I hope I successfully covered everything about LFTs you will ever need to know in the routine clinical care of patients. If you found this video helpful, please remember to click the thumbs up symbol and share it with your friends and colleagues. And as always, feel free to leave questions and comments below.